Hello, I'm Dr. David Polly, and I'm a consultant with SI Bone. Today we're going to discuss the differential diagnosis of musculoskeletal buttock pain with a particular focus on diagnosing SI joint dysfunction. At a basic level, we're going to be talking about applied anatomy. If you have an anatomic structure that's innervated, it can hurt. My military background says we want to shoot at the right target. In other words, you're not going to offer the right treatment if you don't have the right diagnosis. So I've learned a ton about how to try to sort this out. The most important lesson is that if they point directly at their PSIS, there's a high probability that it's the SI joint. That's rule number one. If they point above the PSIS, then I'm thinking it could be lumbosacral facet, superior clunial nerve, or quadratus lumborum in addition to the other commonly diagnosed spinal pathologies. If they point below the PSIS, then 90% of the time it's piriformis syndrome. This area could also be the middle clunial nerve or there may be some involvement of other less common sources of pain. But unless you consider all of these options, you may fix something or offer treatment that doesn't address the true problem and then the patient won't get better. You may just consider that a part of the general clinical success rate when that's not the case. It's really that we shot at the wrong target. I'll also mention that no treatment is 100% effective, but it's usually pretty good. So when I walk into the room and I've greeted the patient, the next thing I'm going to do is to just get a sense of a couple of things while they're sitting. So first I look and see He's well balanced, but sometimes the patient will be unbalanced. An unbalanced patient will be sitting more on one butt cheek than the other, and then I'll ask them to level their buttocks and see if this reproduces the pain. The next thing I'll do, so if the right side is symptomatic, I'll begin with the left side and just sort of check gently the hip range of motion to see if that's an issue. Then when I move to the symptomatic side, I'll put enough force on it to see if this reproduces their typical kind of pain. If I have any sense at all that it's a piriformis syndrome, possibly, then what I'll do is I'll ask the patient to place their heel on their contralateral knee. Now I'm going to ask you to put your hand on your knee here. Take your other hand, grab your heel. I want you to lift up on your heel and push down on your knee at the same time, and I want you to lean forward while maintaining an extended spine and I'll ask if that reproduces their pain. So now that I have the patient standing with their back towards me, I'll ask them to point with one finger to where it is they hurt the most. And here we see him pointing to his posterior superior iliac spine. It's not uncommon for the patient to point with their whole hand and I'll ask him, okay, which finger are you using to point? Now, when he points here, this gives me a high pretest probability that it's the SI joint. However, if he were to point up here, now I'm thinking about superior clunial nerve, quadratus lumborum, and lumbosacral facet. For the superior clunial nerve, what I do is just a gentle palpation across this area to see if he gives me the typical jump consistent with neuroma type of pain. For the quadratus lumborum, I will push hard on the lateral margin of the quadratus lumborum and ask if that is his typical type of pain. And oftentimes, we'll tell a difference in the muscle tension in the affected versus the unaffected side. And then finally, if I'm concerned about the lumbosacral facet, what I'll ask him to do, I want you to twist around from the waist up, looking over your right shoulder like you're trying to back up a car. And now I'm gonna have you lean back like you're trying to look at the ceiling and we'll see if that reproduces their pain at the lumbosacral facet, and I'll usually do it both ways. If, however, he points below the posterior superior iliac spine, now I'm going to palpate along here to the origin of the piriformis muscle and palpate along the course of the piriformis muscle, and I want to make sure I palpate the posterior aspect of the greater trochanter, which is the insertion of the piriformis. If I've had the piriformis stretch test done already and it's positive, then this may be a bit redundant, but it is still potentially helpful. If, however, the piriformis is not at all tender, then I'm going to be looking for the dorsal sacral rami and the middle cluneal nerve, which typically comes just below the posterior inferior iliac spine, and it can come under, through, or above the long dorsal ligament located right here. 
The differential diagnosis is, of course, more extensive, but these are the main things that I see, and these physical exam maneuvers help me in ruling them in or ruling them out with a specific goal of an accurate diagnosis. So let's go back to the patient who stood up and pointed very specifically to the PSIS. Another question is whether physical exam can reliably diagnose the SI joint as the pain generator, and the answer is yes. Learning to do this five-minute exam has become highly reliable. So now I have the patient supine on the exam table, and I start by pointing out we're going to differentiate number one, where it's the posterior superior iliac spine, and number two, where it's the posterior hip capsule. And so when I do these maneuvers, I want to know does it hurt number one or number two. So I start with a gentle log roll to see if there's gross hip pathology and just to sort of get the patient used to being manipulated just a little bit. I'll now bring the hip up to 90 degrees and just do a gentle circumduction and internal and external rotation and no pain number one or number two. Okay. Now I'm going to do the posterior thigh thrust and I'm going to push pretty hard on your knee, 20 to 40 pounds and again does it hurt number one, the posterior superior iliac spine, or number two, the posterior hip capsule? And so I'll do the posterior thigh thrust. In addition, I do a hip scour maneuver to see if there is intraarticular hip pathology. Once that's done, now I'll go to the flexion abduction external rotation or Patrick's test. And again, not so much does it hurt in the front, but does it hurt number one, posterior superior iliac spine, or number two, posterior hip capsule? Pushing on the contralateral pelvis, and it's probably 10 to 20 pounds of force on his knee. Okay. The last test that I do supine is the pelvic gapping test. For this, I want to feel where his anterior iliac crests are located, and I'm going to cross my hands. Now it's not where my hands are, but is it number one or number two? And I'm going to put 20 to 40 pounds of force across this area to see if that reproduces his pain. All right, now I'm going to have you turn on your side facing away from me. And so now it's time for the pelvic compression test. And this can be done with the hips flexed or extended. Sometimes I have to get up on a step stool in order to get adequate leverage because I'm going to really apply a pretty significant force. So I'm going to try to put 20 to 40 pounds of force across his pelvis and ask, does that hurt number one or number two? While we're in this position, I'm now going to do a sideline Gainsland's test. So if you can pull this down leg up towards your chest and grab, grab your knee with both hands. And now I'm going to take this leg and I'm going to bring it back. And that if they say, oh yeah, it's hurting number one or number two, I'll stop. Otherwise, I'm going to come back until I feel a soft tissue constraint to get it a maximum extension. All right. Now for the last exam maneuver, if you'll turn over on your stomach for me. And so then the last test is the sacral thrust. So I find the center of a sacrum with the heel of my dominant hand then put the other hand on top of it, and I'm going to apply a series of blotting maneuvers like this to see if that reproduces the pain either at number one or number two. So if three of these tests are positive, it has an 85% predictive value that they will have a positive response to an SI joint injection. 85% positive predictive value from a physical exam is almost unheard of for spine or pelvic specialty. This makes it predictable enough that it's been referred to as a clinical diagnostic rule. Even with this high degree of confidence, we still send these patients for a diagnostic injection. The intraarticular diagnostic injection is considered to be the reference standard for confirming SI joint pathology. Patients are typically required to have at least one, but usually two positive diagnostic blocks before making a treatment recommendation. So there have been some lessons learned about how to optimize the diagnostic injection. These include no pain medications the day of the injection. I want the patients to do the activities that aggravate their symptoms prior to the test. Oftentimes the car ride is enough. Then immediately after the injection, I want them to get up off the table and do those same aggravating activities to see if the local anesthetic relieves the pain. Also, I want to see a radiographic image from the test. I want to see the needle placement and I want to see the contrast to see if it's tracking within the SI joint 
or if it's a blobogram with extravasation. If I'm not happy with the injection, I have a low threshold for sending the patient for a CT-guided injection. This way I know with 100% certainty that the needle is located within the joint.